Okay, now we need Amelia. There she is. Yay! Zoom is a fun program. Um, and Adam. Amelia and Adam are coming on. Oh, I've been there. That's the Field Museum. That's my house. Um, <laughs> I can see your picture. Um, there we go. Hi. Hi, Amelia. Hi, Adam. Thank you Hi. guys for joining us. Thanks um, for having us. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, okay. So, first, if you guys could introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about your work while we wait for questions to come in, that'd be fantastic. Okay. So, we actually have a PowerPoint made. Awesome. That's okay. Are Let's we able do to do that? Let's do that. I'm totally um, getting it. Okay, good. I, I can make it. it so that it's the biggest thing, or Henry can make it so that it's the biggest thing on the screen. Okay. Yep. So can you all see my desktop? Uh, not yet. Okay. There we go. Now I can. Okay. There Good. We go. but, uh, I'll get this opened up. And we can get rolling. I think we probably uh, first I would about... like First yeah. I'd like to quick announce that um, I Know Dino is going to be matching, matching the first thousand dollars of donation. So while you're donating now, you know that your donation will count for, for double. So this is a great time to donate and ask questions. Okay. Now. Alrighty. <laughs> cool. Neat. Thank you. So uh, I'm Adam Larson. Um, I'm here with Amelia Zietlow. Uh, we are Carthage College graduates of the class of 2020. And we're going to be talking about what we did for our undergraduate theses on the growth and development of mammoths and mosasaurs. My laser pointer. There we go. All right. So just to talk about Carthage Paleo a little bit, this is our squad. This is the biggest it's been, I think, in ever. Usually there's only one student this year. Well, before we all graduated, we had eight, right? Yeah, eight. Um, four of us graduated this year, myself and Adam, and then Douglas and Brady. So for those of us who have started working on or finished our theses, I have the animals that we work on. Next to us, of course, our advisor, Dr. Thomas Carr. Um, here is the group of us in Brisbane for last fall's SVP meeting, minus the freshmen. They, we didn't have funding to bring them. Um, so in our research, we do, we focus on ontogeny or growth of extinct vertebrates. Uh, we also do some field work in the Hell Creek in southeastern Montana. And we bring those fossils back to the Dino Discovery Museum in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am a senior. I graduated in the fall. I'll be starting my PhD at Richard Gilder Graduate School, which is at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. For my undergrad thesis and hopefully for my uh, doctoral thesis, I study mosasaurs. They're, you might know them from the new Jurassic World movies. They're a group of large aquatic predatory lizards that lived in the late Cretaceous from about 94 to 66 million years ago. Uh, their closest living relatives are snakes, monitor lizards, and iguanas, although there's still a bit of debate about which of those groups specifically that they are closest to, um, but they are definitely not related to other marine reptiles, so things like plesiosaurs, not close like they are. They are lizards, they are squamates, um, so of course they're not dinosaurs either. Um, they, some of them grew to be very long, up to 50 feet long or tw uh, 16 meters, with skulls alone almost six feet or two meters long. And they've been found globally. Um, so this guy here, which is now in New York, was found in Kansas of all places. In life, you could imagine they look something like this. So imagine a Komodo dragon, except it's the size of a school bus. It has an extra row of teeth on the top of its mouth. It's got an extra joint in the lower jaw, which would have helped it to um, open wider and suck in prey, which it then grabs onto with those extra teeth. And of course they're aquatic, so they have these paddle-like tip, paddle-like limbs. And now we know that they also had this shark-like or bilobed tail fin. And we know that because the outline of that tail has been preserved in fossils, it's super cool. Um, so the fossil that has that also has like the outline of their paddles. It's really, really cool. Um, so for my undergrad thesis, I actually studied five species of mosasaurs, but I, due to time constraints, I'm only gonna talk about three of them. The two that I will not be talking about, in case you're interested, are called Mosasaurus huffmani and Tethysaurus snapsky. Uh, for this presentation, I'm gonna focus on Tylosaurus. So I studied Proriger, Kansasensis, and Napilicus. All three of these guys lived in the Western Interior Seaway from about 88 to 78 million years ago. 
the Western Interior Seaway was a warm, shallow sea that connected the Arctic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so Kansasensis and Apelicus both lived before Proriger from 88 to 85 million years ago. Kansasensis tend to be smaller than Apelicus, and that's important. I'll come back to that later. Um, and so both of them are smaller than Proriger, which lived later from 84 to 78 million years ago. Just to interrupt real quick. Yes. Someone has a kettle on and the high pitch, someone has some sort of high pitched squeaking sound in the background. Okay, is it, let me turn my mic off and let me know if it stops. Yeah, it stops. Uh, yeah, um, I'm not sure what to do about that, but I thought I would let you guys know that that is an issue people are having in the stream. Okay, yeah. <laughs> continue. Um, is it still doing it? No. Okay, so that one was my headphones. Okay. Um, Perfect. That's okay. All right, are we good? Yes, we're good. Continue. Sorry for interrupting. No, no problem. Thanks for telling me. Uh, I hope I didn't hope it didn't ruin it for you guys. All right. Um, where were we? Oh, Proviger, my my child. Um, so this is the animal that I started my work with. Um, very special to me. One of the first animals that I looked at in person. So there's a picture of me next to the skull at the Field Museum. Um, Proviger is also special because it got to be very big. This guy on the left, this is a cast of the bunker skeleton. It is nearly 50 feet long and this is at Kansas University. They got the cast hanging from the ceiling. It's gorgeous. Um, yeah, and so this guy at the Field Museum is nowhere near that size, even though he looks pretty big next to me. Um, so the next time you visit the Field Museum, of course, you're going to look at Sue, but, you know, go, go in the next room and check this guy out. Um, and a little aside, when you do look at Sue, take a moment and imagine something even bigger, if my slides are going to work. There we go. So that skeleton is based on Sue. The lower one, the Tylosaurus, is based on Bunker. I will not be taking questions, comments, or concerns on this slide, but it is my favorite slide. Moving on, Kansas census and Nepelicus. Uh, these are the other two species, the earlier two that lived at the same time in the same place. And so since they lived at the same time in the same place, and because Kansas census tend to be smaller than Nepelicus, there's a hypothesis that Kansas census are actually juvenile uh, Nepelicus. Um, so that since, Carth at Carthage, we studied growth. That's a hypothesis that I tested in my thesis. And so I will get to the results of that later. And so I study proboscideans. Um, and so proboscideans are a group of animals that the really simple definition is that they have trunks and they have tusks. Um, elephants, mammoths, mastodons, gonfotheres, stegodons, and all sorts of uh, increasingly obscure things with increasingly weird looking teeth. Um, so we can see on the map today, they lived, uh, they had a very wide distribution. Um, so there's only three species alive today, but in the past, odds are wherever you are in the world watching this, um, unless you're watching in Australia or Antarctica, sorry, um, there were at some point um, proboscideans roaming about where you are right now. Um, their closest living relatives today are manatees and hyraxes. Um, which is really funny to think that elephants are closest related today to sea cows and those weird looking marmot like things that live on mountainsides. Real strange. Now the most famous extinct proboscidean is naturally the woolly mammoth. Um, everyone's favorite character from the Ice Age movies naturally. Um, and so woolly mammoths would have lived uh, they lived for about 600,000, 650,000 years in total as a species. Um, living in Siberia as well as northern North America. Um, most of them went extinct at the end of the Ice Age, but there was a small population that lived on Wrangell Island uh, off the coast of Siberia, and they lived till about 4,000 years ago. Um, so if you've ever heard the, you know, fun fact of there were mammoths alive when the pyramids were being built, that is true. And it was this small population, uh, nowhere near Egypt, but nevertheless a small population that was alive, hanging out and doing their thing on a single island as basically a single herd for a very long time. Uh, proboscideans are nice to study uh, because for a lot of the species, we have a lot of specimens. Um, so this is a picture from the mammoth site in Hot Springs, South Dakota, a very fun place to visit. And it has over 50 individuals of both Colombian and woolly mammoths. Um, 
And proboscideans, we know from living elephants, they had sort of unique social quirks. Um, so if you were a female elephant, you're going to be living in basically the same herd your entire life. But if you're a male elephant or presumably male mammoth, once you achieve sexual maturity, you're getting kicked out and now get to roam around completely on your own uh, without adult supervision, so to speak. Um, and all of the specimens we see here are all males, um, mostly young males, a few older males. Um, what's believed has happened is that this was a watering hole, but that had very steep edges. And so what would happen is that isolated males would be walking along, would see water, would go, oh, hey, I can drink that, and then would go in, get stuck, be unable to get out, would drown, and this happened over 50 times, apparently, because that's how many specimens there are. Um, and the females aren't falling in because these female herds would be led by matriarchs who would be older, more mature, intelligent individuals that would know, hey, we're not going to go and get a drink from that watering hole. It's a bad idea. Let's go on to the next one. Um, so bad news for those mammoths, but good news for us because then we've got a whole bunch of specimens. Now, today there are three living species of proboscidean. Um, so the one we're most commonly familiar with, the one we see really often would be the African savanna elephant. Um, there's another species from Africa though that doesn't get nearly as much press, that's the African forest elephant. Um, that one's a lot smaller. Uh, it's only been known as a separate species definitively for about 20 years. Um, it's way less studied in part just because it's small and lives in jungles and is way more difficult to study than something that hangs out on savannas. And then there's, of course, also the Asian elephant as well. And so in my thesis, I looked at eight species of proboscidean, so the three species of living elephants, as well as straight tusked elephants, uh, three species of mammoths, and the American mastodon. Alrighty, so like I mentioned, at Carthage, we studied growth in extinct animals, and we do this using a method called cladistic analysis of ontogeny. So because evolution, or okay, so this is based on the analysis or the analogy that growth, like evolution, is a hierarchical series of changes that accumulate over time. So in this example, let's imagine a bone, and as the animal gets older, the bone grows a couple of lumps, and these lumps show up in a specific order we can code the presence or absence of these lumps just like you would an evolutionary character. So if the lump is present, it would get a one, and if it's absent, it would get a zero. So instead, but instead of the one being, you know, more evolved or derived and the zero being basal or ancestral, the zero is less mature, the one is more mature. And if we have characters that progress beyond two states, then we just, you know, code with higher numbers like you do in evolution. So, so we look at these bones, we look for specific features, they might be lumps or bumps, or they might be proportions or size or anything like that. We use all the data that we can get. Um, and we code them out, we make these data matrices. And we take those data matrices and run them in a phylogenetic software. In, in our case, we use PALP and TNT. And that gives us a tree. Um, in an evolutionary study, this is a cladogram. In our study, since we're looking at growth or ontogeny, we call it an ontogram. So the way this works is the least mature animal is over here on the left, and they get progressively more mature as you move to the right. And in our diagrams, the most mature individual is indicated with an arrow. These characters here are the growth characters, the shared growth characters. So for example, specimen B is at growth stage two. Two, it has both lump two and lump one, but it's missing lumps three and four. So once we have the ontogram or the growth series, we can describe the growth changes or the growth stages. So this specimen A is the least mature, so it's stage one, and it's diagnosed by the presence of lump one, the absence of all the other lumps. Specimen B, stage two, lump two and one are present, the other two are absent, and so on. Hopefully. And so cladistic analysis of ontogeny uh, helps solve problems with how growth series are usually done. Usually when talking about growth, we categorize animals into sort of larger categories. Um, so in this case, so common things are we have juveniles, subadults, and adults. Um, now that is somewhat useful in sort of generally distinguishing things, but the problem is you can have a lot of variety within those very broad categories. Um, 
for instance, if you were talking about growth in humans, uh, I am a human adult. Um, Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers is a human adult, and Morgan Freeman is also a human adult. We're all human adults, but we're definitely at very different levels of maturity. Um, and so what cladistic analysis gets us is a high resolution growth series where each stage has specific changes. And so by looking at different stages, we can go and compare relative maturities much more specifically. So an individual at growth stage six is more mature than individuals at stage five, but less mature than individuals at stage seven. And so as an example, um, we have a uh, human ontogram here. Um, so the pictures on the ends of the branches, those are the four specimens involved. Um, and so we've got growth characters uh, plotted and onto the ontogram there. So adult teeth, wisdom teeth, gray hair, and hair loss. Um, and so each individual represents a separate growth stage in this case. And so you can determine what growth stage an individual is at based on the presence or absence of the mature states of characters. Um, so for instance, I am more mature than the baby because I possess adult teeth. Uh, that's the mature character state of that. Um, however, I am less mature than Aaron Rodgers because I don't have wisdom teeth. Um, in this case, Morgan Freeman is the most mature individual here. Um, because he has the mature character state of all four characters. So he has adult teeth, he has wisdom teeth, he has gray hair, and he has hair loss. Another cool thing that this method allows us to do is test for the presence of sexual dimorphism, which is when males and females look different from one another. Uh, this is limited, of course, to the skeleton or to the, for me specifically, I didn't mention earlier, I only looked at skulls. Um, so it's limited to those characters. So for example, in Mosasaurs, if males are blue and females are red, I won't know that because I don't have that information. But what it will tell me is if the males and females have different, if the bones themselves are different or if they have different maybe patterns or, yeah, patterns of growth from each, from one another. And so how this happens is if sexual dimorphism is, dimorphism is not present, the ontogram is linear. So it's just a straight line with specimens and the most mature at the top. However, if it is present, there's a couple different things that could happen. First of all, the ontogram could split or branch into two different groups. If our sample has juveniles and adults, the juveniles will be at the bottom. This split represents the onset of sexual maturity. And we get a group of males and a group of females because they're changing differently now. Um, if our sample only has adults, it'll split at the base and because they're, they're all adults, they're all sexually mature, so they're already changing differently. Um, and finally, the other thing that could happen is maybe there's not enough characters to support or to cause the tree to split, but the program might optimize individual variations that are shared among the sexes. So basically, um, in here, all these guys have character Z. Let's say those are the females. They have, let's say it's a bump on a bone. And these guys who all have character Y, which is a bump on a different bone, are the males. So they're sharing features that the other group does not share. So that's the other way that could show up. And how this relates to me testing hypotheses of, of taxonomy. So that Kansas census napilicus, are they the same or are they not? Um, if they are the same, it's um, it would look like this here. So it'd be linear. And the Kansas census are all recovered as juveniles. Napilicus are recovered as adults. Or what could happen is maybe they're sexual dimorphs of one another. So in this case, one branch is all Napilicus, one is all Kansas census. Um, that could be sexual dimorphism, but that could also be that they are actually two different species. So that's how I test that hypothesis. Um, and so these are my results. So these are actually my ontograms for Tylosaurus proviger and Kansas census Napilicus. Um, so again, I tested that hypothesis about these two, and that's why they are included in the same analysis. Napilicus is in blue, so there's one down here, one here, one here, and the rest of them are all up top. So what that means is most of the Napilicus are more mature than almost all of the Kansas census. Ergo, they're probably the same species. And this hypothesis that Kansas census are juveniles is supported. So from here on, I'm just going to call them all Napilicus. Um, some interesting things happening, like these guys, I. I don't have the list in front of me, but they share a couple growth changes, which isn't too surprising because they are closely related. Um, overall, what's happening in these animals is the skull is getting bigger, deeper, and more robust. Um, 
one bone in particular called the quadrate. It's this question mark shaped bone here um, in, in this image up here. It's up, it's right above my little laser pointer there. Um, it's a jaw joint bone, so it connects the lower jaw to the skull. Um, it's also involved in their hearing. Uh, that bone is really important in growth. It turns out like it gets all these crazy bumps and ridges on it, and I'll talk about it a little more later. Um, so that is happening in, in both of these guys and then also in the other two mosasaurs that I looked at um, that I'm not talking about here. Um, and then finally, another interesting thing that I found was that the, the snout or the snoot, if you will, of these guys, the premaxillary rostrum, in the juveniles, it's really slender and kind of gently rounded. And in the adults, it gets really big and knobbed, which is interesting because Tylosaurus means knobbed lizard. So this character that these guys are named after is actually something that grows in as they get older. Something else I did, so now that I had the growth series, I could test other hypotheses. So one of the things I wanted to know was, can you tell how old a Mosasaur is, in this case, Tylosaurus, by how big it is? So the two measures of size that I used are skull length, which are these graphs on the top, and quadrate height, so that's that jaw, jaw bone, because um, not all the skulls are complete. And short answer is, yeah, you can, if, if you have a skull in front of you and you know how big it is, you can take a stab at how mature it is and you probably won't be wrong. However, I think, yeah, in every one of these, it's important to note that the most mature individual is not the biggest. So these two dots here, not the biggest, and in the Pelicus also, not the biggest. Um, and that was also found in the recent study on T-Rex growth. The largest individual was not the most mature. Um, and here, so here's another look, or closer look at these quadrate bones. Uh, the top are pro rigor, the bottom are napilicus, and you can see how they are changing as they grow up. So this is from the least mature animals are on the left, progressing to more mature. So this is actually Bunker. This is that big guy hanging from the ceiling in Kansas University. Um, I guess to point out a cool feature is this bump here. It's called the infrastapedial process. It's been mentioned in the literature. People have noted that it changes, but they didn't think it was due to growth. Well, let me tell you what, it's really small and subtle here, and it grows in and gets real big and exaggerated. And in the Pelicus, it's actually absent in the juveniles, and it grows in in the adults. It never gets quite as big as it does in Proriger, but it does clearly grow in. So one day I decided, you know what, I'm gonna have some fun. I didn't have any expectations for this. I'm gonna run all three of these guys together because why not, I'm bored. I'm wasting time on something more important. And lo and behold, there was a pattern. So this is top secret. I submitted this for publication a couple weeks ago. So I'm not gonna tell you what each of these colors are, but each of these colors are one of these species, Proregrinopelicus and Kansas census. The dotted, so I guess the dotted and the dashed lines are juveniles and subadults based on the previous analysis. And you can see there's a clear pattern of juveniles to subadults to adults, except for this one weirdo here who's, who's a weirdo in other ways, but I won't get into that. And there's also this progression of juveniles of this one species to adults of another, adults of a third, and then back to the adults of the first one. So yeah, I hope to tell you guys more about it, but for now it's just a teaser. I'm really excited about it because with this I've been able to uh, basically propose a new hypothesis that no one has proposed in Mosasaurs before, so I'm, I'm really excited about this diagram. That's always fun. Yeah. And so uh, with my work on proboscideans, um, most of my growth characters are related to bone fusion, uh, specifically epiphyseal fusion. Uh, so all mammals undergo epiphyseal fusion, so that's the fusing in long bones of the bony caps of the bone to the shaft. Um, in most mammals, this occurs around the time of sexual dimorphism, or sexual dimorph sexual maturity, I should say. Um, but uh, in elephants, it's really weird in that it takes a really long time, and in some cases just doesn't happen at all. Um, so... Uh, African savanna elephants uh, achieve sexual maturity around the age of 10, um, but there have been individuals found in their 60s and even early 70s that still have bones that are unfused. Um, it's really unusual for it to take such a long time, but because it's so slow, it means we can actually determine the order that bones are fusing a bit easier uh, than in species where it happens way faster. 
um, because they're fusing in a, you know, over a span of decades. Whereas for, you know, even humans, it happens in less than 10 years. Uh, so because it's a more spread out process, it's a lot easier to go and determine what order things are happening in. And so I recovered 14 growth series in total. So eight for each of the species uh, that I studied and then six sex segregated uh, ontograms. Um, so for some of the species, uh, I had enough individuals that were identified as being male or female to go and put them in separate ontograms to go and see if there are any differences. Um, it's one of the other nice things about working with proboscideans is because there are living members. Um, it's more easy, it's much easier to determine the sex of an individual based on non super obvious characters. Um, so for instance, we know uh, if you find a female wool, or if you, sorry, if you find a woolly mammoth um, with very wide pelvis and very small tusks, it's most likely a female. Um, there are also other things you can do to determine the sex of these individuals and that allows uh, for sex segregated trees to be done um, rather than the other methods uh, that we talked about previously. Uh, one of the neat things of these growth series is that in general, they all pretty, they align in a lot of ways. And so we can actually find a sort of consensus growth series for Elephantidae as a group. Um, so that would be the group that includes elephants and mammoths, sorry, mastodons, they're outside of that group. Um, so they don't get included. I didn't have enough data for them. Um, but there is a general order for Elephantidae and for that order with Elephantidae, I can then compare that order to other mammals to go and see how they're changing. So that's what this is right here. So this is a cladogram of mammalia. Elephantidae is at the far left. Um, and so this is looking at uh, whether the, if the epiphysis of the proximal end of the radius fuses before the epiphysis of the proximal end of the ulna. Um, so if a species has a black square underneath its name and then a black line extending down from it, that means it's happening in the same order as in elephants. So think A and then B. If there's a white square and a white line extending down, then it is the opposite order. So think B and then A. And so from this, we can go and determine synapomorphy. So shared derived characters or evolutionary characters of things that these animals have in common due to a shared common ancestor. Um, so in this case, we can see that the same character order that we see in elephants is actually a synapomorphy of eutheria. So placental mammals, they are all doing this same general thing due to shared ancestry. Um, and the opposite order is actually a synapomorphy of both marsupials and primates. Um, which is interesting. And then we've also got a few, an autopomorphy of uh, rhesus monkeys doing their own thing and converging on the general mammal plan again. Uh, now there's uh, the most unusual uh, synapomorphy that was found uh, would be uh, the epiphysis of the distal end of the femur fusing before the epiphysis of the proximal end of the radius. Um, so if you look here, that happens in elephants and then in all other species of mammals included, except for one, it's the opposite order. Um, so B before A is the synapomorphy of all mammals. Um, and then elephants and koalas are the exception. Um, yeah, and so that's naturally a really weird um, because elephants and koalas don't have a whole heck of a lot in common. I mean, elephants are, giant and you know walk around a lot of the time and eat all sorts of plants and travel long distances and koalas spend most of their time asleep in a single tree eating a single kind of leaves um so as to why they've converged on the same sequence i'm really not sure um previous research has found that the orders tend to be the order of these bone fusion sequences tend to be more uh, due to phylogenetic influences than morphological influences. Um, but it still raises a really big question of why the heck are elephants and koalas doing their own thing when basically all other mammals that I've looked at are doing the opposite, which is strange. But hopefully someday I'll figure it out or someone else will figure it out. And that's all we've got for you guys. So we obviously thank the Dino Nerds for Black Lives group for inviting us to present here, the Paleo Squad. Thank you for guys. And yeah, thank you guys all for coming to watch us talk and we'll we'll take questions now, I guess. Yeah, uh, people are trying, try, currently trying to think of questions to ask. Uh, oh, we got, a the couple, chat. we got a couple so questions that. without Thank donations. you guys so much for joining us. That was really fascinating. I'm also just amazed at such 
two such different groups, mosasaurs and, mas- and mammoths, could be brought together into one presentation. And so seamlessly. It's amazing. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, yeah. Uh, if there's anything else you'd like to throw in that you feel like you forgot during the thing, during your talk, while we wait for any questions, that's fine. Right now, we don't have anything scheduled. So you can stay as long as you would like. Uh, because what's scheduled next is me and the other people who are awake in the middle of the night doing anything we can to get people to donate. So that's the next thing on the schedule. Um, yeah, so there you go. Um, yeah, yeah, can you guys hear me again. on the Zoom chat? That was, yeah. nice. that was really great. Cool. Thanks for having us. Yeah, of course. I guess not. Um, <laughs> Someone called me out for saying it was the middle of the night. In my defense, it's 10 p.m. where I am. Anyway. Um, yeah, so, 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 yeah. Uh, also, if you... We got a couple questions without donation. Uh, where are they? That is a fantastic question. That is a fantastic thing. Um, are there any predators preserved with the mammoth, mammoth death trap? Um... As for, uh, off the top of my head, there aren't any full large predators that I remember from when I visited. Um, and I mean, there are remains of basically other things that fell in. Um, they've got a lot of just other stuff in there. Um, it's actually a very, um, uh, very good uh, microfossil site. Uh, just mm-hmm. because it was this pond, they've got all sorts of little tiny things of uh, sea pods, uh, plants, little uh, shelled animals and stuff that they'll find. So they, they're they very, um, definitely a lot of detail oriented um, digging out of things of going through, right. if they sift things, um, got that all set up to go and find all sorts of other things that are able to tell us about the um, climate and other conditions. Um, but I don't think, I don't think they have any like. There's one, there's a cave bear. They have one cave bear skull. Right, yeah, went, okay. So we okay. Went for, for, for Montana, when we went out to Montana, we stopped there and they're like, yeah, we have one cave bear and it's locked up in a secret place. And like one person has the key, so, okay. But yeah, one cave bear, but otherwise, yeah, no. Yeah, it, it, yeah. <laughs> um. How do you untangle uh, the ontogeny of the two Tylosaur species from Pedamorphosis? From Pedamorphosis. Yeah, sorry, I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Oh. No, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> um, because similar things happen in Proriger. So, like, from comparing these guys to Proriger and to the other two that I don't, I don't talk about them just for time, but the other two are doing similar things. So, like, um, and then in, like, I showed the pictures of the quadrates. I don't, I don't have the bones labeled, but it's basically a progression of Kansas census to Nepilicus. And so, techni- and then the thing about pedomorphosis is the, act- the, the definition of it is truncation of development in 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 a oh god i'm forgetting i'm missing up ancestor just descendant okay truncate truncation or slowing of development in an uh damn uh (laughs) descendant species relative to an ancestral one um and that's not the case because they lived at the same time so they are not each other's ancestor per se like unless the the problem with mosasaurs is the stratigraphic data especially american ones the stratigraphic Mm -hmm. data is kind of garbage so it could be like i personally i'm kind of hesitant about this because my data set is kind of skewed like i have a lot more kansas census than i do nepilicus and that's just because the museums that i've been to have more kansas census um Mm -hmm. i haven't been to i think yale has like a bunch of nepilicus um so I'm still hesitant, but also like this, the, the method's solid. The method's solid. And then that, uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about that. I guess I can say the tree, the, the third one where I ran all three of them together, there's more evidence. So that would have picked up pedomorphy, but that it doesn't happen um, to, to put it on. But that's a good question. There's actually another hypothesis of pedomorphy in Prairie, um, because it's a later species. They have this like ridge on their forehead 
and Napilicus supposedly doesn't have it. So when, but Kansas census do, so they were thinking, oh, the Ridge is a juvenile character and then it goes away in the adults and Proregur, it just keeps it. Well, I looked at the other Mosasaurs and they all have it. Napilicus and specifically only two specimens don't have it. So that's actually an instance of, uh, it's called paramorphy, which is the opposite of pedomorphy where it's an extension of growth relative to the ancestral species. Because one of the other species I look at, Tethysaurus, is a really basal ancestral kind of lizardy guy. Um, yeah, no, that's right. Okay, uh, someone has also asked, wow, is there only a skull at the site? I can't remember. With the, the cave berry they're asking? I think so. Uh, there's, I only I, have the context I'm given. <laughs> I've, I'm pretty sure they have a skull and there might be a little more, but it's not a complete skeleton. I know that much. I know there's at least a skull and then maybe like some finger bones or something. Yeah, it's not, it's not as nice a, um, it's not like the La Brea tar pits where you've got a whole variety of things. It's the mammoth site because it's legitimately like several dozen mammoths. I think it's 50 who I could be off by a few mammoths, um, you know. Um, that is a mammoth I, amount of mammoths. I'm yeah, sorry. I, I, <laughs> 50, 51, I believe. There's 48 Colombian mammoths and three woolly mammoths That's in cool. some form. Um, I include, I believe, two Colombian mammoths from the mammoth site in my data set. Um, the woolly mammoths are only represented, I believe, by teeth which makes it a bit tricky to figure out about bone fusion when all you have is a tooth, but. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, petition to replace all currency with mammoths. I mean, <laughs> I feel like that would go poorly, but. It, well, well, I mean, I mean, it's, it's a joke suggestion, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not promoting going and using mammoths as money. Um, but I will go and say that is a really bizarre quirk of, because mammoths are extinct, they're not protected by conservation laws that protect endangered species. So it is legal to trade in mammoth ivory. Um, I'm not saying go out and get yourself mammoth ivory, but this is a thing. Um, and so, for so instance, the Nemets reindeer herders in Siberia um, there's actually some of them that make their livings um, going out and finding uh, woolly mammoths that are just sort of thawing out um, of Siberia. Um, uh, I believe it was, I think, Vereshigan, who's a, a Russian uh, mammoth researcher, has estimated that there's possibly several hundred thousand woolly mammoths that are frozen in permafrost across Siberia just because it preserves really well. It's a really large area. Um, there's not a whole lot to mess with them there. Um, but yeah, so in terms of today, that is sort of is a thing. Um, but in, in terms of past things, mammoth would have been, uh, or mammoth things would have been traded. Uh, we have um, little mammoth, we have carvings of mammoths in mammoth ivory, which I think is, is kind of fun. Um, those have been right. great objects. Um, and actually in um, what would today be Southern Poland and uh, let's see, it would be uh, Western Ukraine. Uh, we actually have um, evident, archeological evidence of houses made of mammoth bones that they went, because mammoths have big bones and these guys were hunting enough that to go and take things like the scapulae, so the shoulder blades and other large bones and lash them together until you have a hut that's made of mammoth bones, which is wild to think about. So if you have ancestry from somewhere in Eastern Europe, it's possible that you had ancestors 40,000 years ago living in houses made of woolly mammoths. That's really wild at the end of the day. We do have a question uh, for Amelia from Tim Gannon um, that is accompanied by a donation. Uh, I must have missed this part of the presentation, but how are Moses Lord's lizards? How are they lizards? Oh boy. <laughs> a whole list of right. things that I don't have memorized. Um, there's a, there's, so I give, I give a, a whole spiel on this. Like when, when it's not, we, we, the, the presentation we made for this is kind of our uh, more 
public presentation, like for people of all levels of science kind of thing. But in, in like the full scale presentations I show, and I know there, there's more science that goes into it than this, but if you were to take a Komodo dragon skull and a Mosasaur skull, mm -hmm. They're almost identical. It's insane. Like they're they're not identical. That's that's why there's still debate. Like we don't know what these things are, but they are squamates, and right. so these squamates are lizards and basically lizards. They're lizards, and they're like they're up in there. They're not basal. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm moving around and glitching, but uh, my room's a mess. Hence the virtual background. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> um yeah, they're. There, there's a list of snapomorphies that I don't have memorized. I think one thing that, for example, w the reason we know they're not dinosaurs is I think dinosaurs, archosaurs have an extra, is it they have an extra fenestra? I think so. Not or something like I, that. I do not do synapomorphy research, so I don't know off the top of my head. I have. <laughs> What's funny is someone asked me, so for my, for my thesis, I actually did at Carthage, I did an undergrad defense, so I gave a 45 minute talk and then was asked questions, and that was someone's question was like, why are they not dinosaurs? And afterwards, so, so Dr. Carr- Because they aren't descended from the common ancestor of the Guanadon in the that's wrong. <laughs> so we, like, like we mentioned, we, our, our advisor is Dr. Carr, who, by the way, he's great. But anyway, after we give a talk, for any reason, he'll, go, he'll say, all right, we got to do a post-mortem. That's how he phrases it. And he's like, we're going to do a post-mortem. Like, okay. So we do our post-mortem. He's like, you need to know the synapomorphies for when someone asks that again. I'm like, okay. Oh, goodness. Right, I'll, do it. I'll have a better answer probably a couple months from now. That's when valid. I, when I get it. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a whole list of things. And it starts with just look at the skulls. Um, right. They're they're different. They're, they're better. But we won't have that Fair argument. Um, Adam, anything interest, any interesting comments on the ontogeny of M. Americanum compared to Elephantid? Sorry, um, I, my first language is actually not English, so <laughs> my pronunciation is not fantastic. No, that, that, that was fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I wish I had some really fun things to say about the ontogeny <laughs> of uh, Mammut Americanum of the American Mastodon. Um, but um, so I mentioned that I could not go and include them in with the general uh, trend that I discovered or found of Elephantidae um, because American Mastodons are outside of that group and I wasn't able to find anything from it because my Mastodon data is really not useful. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't remember what it is right now, but as of when I turned in my thesis, um, I, it had, I believe, uh, five individuals, which isn't really great, but in some cases you'd get information from it. Um, but in my case, it just had a single character um, that a tooth came in. That was the one growth character. Um, so I was able to separate the individuals that didn't have a tooth and then the ones that had a tooth, um, which isn't terribly useful. Um, it's especially not useful in the case of uh, proboscideans because their uh, teeth have been studied extensively. That's actually the primary way of aging living elephants because they only have six teeth, um, technically 24, but they only have six teeth, um, sets of teeth throughout their lifetime. And each set of teeth is just like four teeth, one, 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 one. Um, and so it's just the wear patterns on the teeth. And so knowing that, ooh, they, they lose a tooth, great, really isn't that useful. It'd be the equivalent of, um, you know, me doing uh, one of humans and being able to categorize, these kids don't have adult teeth and these adults do have adult teeth. That's what we know about their growth. It's not, unfortunately, not all that useful. Um, so I can't really talk a whole lot about American Mastodon uh, ontogeny, unfortunately. So. Fair enough. Uh, do we have any more questions for these guys before we let them uh, ch check out of here? Um, not that I see so far. Um, anything interesting within Elephant today as compared with modern elephants, perhaps? Um, so like um, living versus extinct differences? I believe that's what they mean, yeah. Um, 
really there weren't a whole lot it was difference it, the from what i remember the differences would be um by clade um so within elephantidae um so one clade would be um uh so weirdly enough so um asian elephants are closer related to mammoths than they are to african elephants both savannah and forest um savannah elephants and forest elephants are sister taxa um, but then Asian elephants are over basically on the line getting towards mammoths. Um, so if you want to think of an Asian elephant as a non-hairy mammoth, you could in some ways. Um, or a, a proto-mammoth, it just, it's, you know, it, it hasn't hit a growth spurt and grown out the hair yet. Um, so the, the differences are more in uh, those clades than any differences between the living ones and the extinct ones. Uh, so... All right. Well, uh, is it true that some Asian elephants have some mammoth DNA mixed in from possible inbreeding? Uh, I believe so. Um, don't quote me on that because um, <laughs> I'm I'm no geneticist. Um, right. <laughs> that that wouldn't be surprising very much. That wouldn't really be surprising um, that there'd be something in there um because um i think in in this scenario um i'd really have to think about what the natural range of asian elephants is of right. how close they would be um right. because they're adapted to such different habitats um just because mm -hmm. uh mammoth fur for woolly mammoths can be a single strand of hair can be three feet long um they've got or, no. Yeah. It's like 18 inches to three feet. So they're really, it's very long, thick hair. Um, whereas Asian elephants, uh, don't, um, right. So they're living in different areas. Um, and so I'd have to go and check a distribution map of historically where Asian elephants were, because, you know, they would have been in Southern China a heck of a lot more than they are right now. Just because right. of people, um, things like that. But I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there were, I mean, some, mammoth DNA hanging out. I mean, they're, they're closely related anyways. Um, right. So. I, I, I felt the need to let you know that the chat has decided to call Asian elephants peeled mammoths, <laughs> which is it's terrible. something I'm never going to get out of my head. So thank you, chat. <laughs> I am so sorry that I dropped this to you, but I'm also not sorry. <laughs> um, all right, so I don't know when you guys want to head out. We do still have a couple other questions, but I don't want to keep you here too long because, you know. Are they late. are they just through the email or are they in the, like the chat? They're in the chat. So these aren't donation questions. So you're also under no obligation to answer them. Okay. <laughs> I have to say like, so, so actually funny thing, we actually, so Carthage Paleo every Monday and Friday has been having like a Google Meet hangout to, you know, stave mm -hmm. off the loneliness. And so. Right. <laughs> I could uh, I could hit up the chat and answer people um, if there are things that I can answer. But okay, yeah, no, yeah. So, go yeah. for it. Uh, other otherwise, I mean, I I, I like answering questions. So. <laughs> I so. mean, these are the people who brought us peeled mammoths. <laughs> I, I mean, maybe we could go with um, uh, mammoths that uh, you know have hair loss or something. You know, <laughs> I mean, there are obviously much more palatable nicknames for Asian elephants, but I'm not going to be able to get peeled mammoth out of my head. For the rest of my life. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, it, goodness, there's some questions about dinosaurs and anthropologies that none of us here are actually qualified to answer. Um, any comments on the relationship between Paleoloxodon and the modern forest elephant? Uh, oh, that's, <laughs> um, Gosh, uh, so much range. <laughs> they're they're related. Um, that's I can I can tell you that. Um, but <laughs> they are on the in the same general neck of the woods. Um, it's closer related to that than they're closer related to each other than they would be to mammoths or um, Asian elephants, for that matter. Um, and significantly more than that of mastodons. Um, mastodons diverged from other mammoths like 25 million years ago. 
Uh, so they've been right. kind of going and doing their own thing for a while, or were doing their own thing. Um, right. But I can't comment a whole heck of a lot on the relationships there. Um, Paleoloxodon, uh, in from from my research, isn't one of the species that I have uh, real great data with either. Sure. Um, so I haven't focused as much on that as I have with other ones that I just have more specimens and more more data um, to go and look at. So. Sure. Um, we do have another thing. I mean, everyone really wants to, everyone has questions. Uh, how do you feel about talks about the extinction and attempts to bring back the mammoth? I feel, uh, yeah, I'm no. surprised we didn't get here already, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's always the thing. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's probably not really happening. Um, like, like, frankly, like, um, okay. I mean, because when you think about it, you know, because because the headline is mammoth DNA sequence, you know, sequenced, but it's mitochondrial DNA, which is like forty thousand base pairs. Whereas, and it's not the rest of the cell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the rest of the cell is the interesting part. You know, <laughs> the mitochondria is this. You know well-conserved thing of, I mean, if you gave an Asian elephant woolly mammoth mitochondria, it's not just going to go and start sprouting hair like it's, you know, taking, you know, doing that laser hair cap or something, or, you know, taking over-the-counter treatments for, you know. Um, right. In some ways, it would be cool if we could, but we, it, it's really not at all likely um, to happen um, I mean people are gonna try certainly of course they are. and I mean go for them like that's you know it's cool to try um, but it does raise a whole bunch of really just sort of like oh gee didn't think about that questions when you think about it further because um, what do you do with these animals do you go and you just you just sort of make one and then I have this I have a mammoth now what do I do with it you know, um, there are more um, sort of uh, uh, more uh, hypothesizing ideas, kind of further out there ideas of that you could introduce uh, herds of mammoths back into Siberia and that they would actually go and it would be a return of a capstone species to the area like elephants are in uh, Africa, in this African savanna. And so that if you reintroduced woolly mammoths into Siberia that would actually like change the habitat there and you know do all sorts of things um I think one of the ideas was that it would help with like climate change and stuff or other things I don't know but first of all you'd have to freaking get it back and that's really right yeah like I the extinction is, is a complicated topic to begin with but like mammoths are very much so dead <laughs> Yeah. And their world is very much so gone. It's not like bringing back passenger pigeons. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. the, you, you know, the ice caps would have to be shared by polar bears and woolly mammoths. I don't know. Right. You know. <laughs> and there's bears. only so much ice cap left at this point. <laughs> not to bring a downer into a chat about dead animals or anything. <laughs> We're already there. Um, so, yeah, I'm amused at certain questions that are happening in the chat. There is a serious one. I have found a serious one. Um, when doing ontogenetic cladistics, do age groups clade together? Yeah, and I asked what... Okay, so never mind. And there's an explanation of the genus or the age. Um, form a clade together to the exclusion of other members of the species. So do you mean, like, maybe... Oh, okay. I think I know what you're talking about. So I think. Okay, let me try to think about this. Okay, do juveniles of a certain age form a clade together? Um, no, you're not. It's it's a complicated method. It took us literally. Okay, so to explain how we learned this method real quick, it was me and two other students in a room with Dr. Carr for three hours twice a week. For oh, a semester. <laughs> oh no, it was a blast. Okay. But I, it's a lot. Um, I'm just trying to 
uh and then yeah and then someone wants me to talk about the egg i will get to the egg i'm angry about it but anyway <laughs> um <laughs> anyway okay so basically are you okay so do you know a certain age okay so i think are you talking about like chronological age i uh, assume so okay uh -huh. i don't have the histo for it so i don't unfortunately none of the animals or specifically the specimens that I've looked at, no one's done histo on them. There's been very little histo and what there is, of course, none of those animals have skulls. And so far I've looked at that. So anyway, short answer, usually no, in that like, there's not like if you, if you so back to the ontogram, there wasn't a lot of like groups. Um, if you if you look at Carr's um, ontogram for T-Rex, there's actually some groups within some of the age groups or within some of the stages. Um, and that can happen if you just, if, honestly, if you just have a lot of specimens, he has more than I do. Um, or, you know, sometimes it, it just happens, but usually that doesn't happen. Like it's usually a nice, or with, with this data set, it's been a nice progression of like, this one is younger than this one is younger than this one. Like it's a nice stepwise thing. Like that also doesn't always happen. Sometimes they do clade out or branch out like that. Um, and there is a weird group happening in Pro Rigor that I'm not sure what to think of. I low key thought it might be sexual dimorphism, but there's just not enough evidence. So I'm not, I don't want to dive down that rabbit hole. Um, about the egg, I don't like it. I don't think it's a Mosasaur because there's just so much evidence out there that they have live birth, first of all. For like, first of all, there's no bones with it. Second of all, it's near shore. So it probably just washed it in the water. Third of all, we have evidence that even the basal things, so like Aegialosaurs and um, one specifically, it's called Carsosaurus. They have embryos in them and however they are arranged or whatever, like it's, it's live birth. There's no eggs around, there's no shells around them. Um, that if if it was a mosasaur egg it would have to be a basal mosasaur but since it's from 68 million years ago the only things that it could be <laughs> i'm sorry i saw boneless leg or boneless egg and that threw me off um the only two animals that could possibly be in our antarctica that i know about are either tanniwasaurus which is a derived relative of tylosaurus um so again derived it's not going to have an egg it's going to be full-on Vivipar either viviparous or ovoviviparous, but okay, that's another problem. But anyway, or it's Huffmani. Um, Huffmani is great, by the way, because it's big and it's been found like all over the Atlantic. So I have lots of memes about Huffmani that unfortunately I couldn't share with you guys today. But anyway, um, yeah, so the other problem with that paper that I have is that they don't quite seem to understand eggs <laughs> or reproduction. Like they talk about um, a vestigial egg. Like, oh, things that give live birth, you know, the reptiles that give live birth still have this vestigial egg. It's like, no, they don't. <laughs> Some do, and those are called ovoviviparous because ovo egg. Um, uh, they, what, and what happens is the eggs, they still hatch inside the mother. Like, and I'm guessing, I guess the eggs would be expelled after that, but right. I, don't, I disagree. I don't know what it is. I'm not. Honestly, I'm not opposed to it being a mosasaur. Obviously, I'm science. I'm open to new information, but there's no bones, and there, there's not enough evidence right now. Um, yeah, <laughs> I know enough about eggs to have more of an opinion. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, I'm more relaxed because you know I don't have to deal with elephant eggs being. <laughs> you know? um, uh, I, I will add um, for elephant for, um, for my stuff. There are. Um, not age clusters, but at least from estimates of chronological age that have been done uh, based on uh, toothware research. Um, the uh, toothware uh, based chronological ages uh, do align with the uh, growth stages of maturity uh, for most of the species that I have. Um, so. Okay, cool. Uh, do we have any more questions, or are we finally going to allow Adam and Amelia to escape? Um, <laughs> not that you haven't been enjoying this, but, you know, et cetera. Um, I'm amused at all of the, can I offer you an egg in these trying times? 
because scientists are by nerds. Um, yeah, I think we've got everything covered. So thank you guys so much. Oh, we got one check the Discord. Thanks, Henry. Um, I am able. Could mo could Mosasaur vocalize like whales do? I have no idea. I <laughs> I'm gonna say no, <laughs> just right. based on let's let's cite Whitmer. Is it Whitmer 1995, the extant phylogenetic bracket? Let's go to that. Yeah, 95. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if they sounded like anything, it would be a lizard or a snake. So I'm guessing they hissed, probably. But I don't think they... There's no evidence for them to have uh, done the whole echolocation thing. Like, there's no right. divot in the forehead for the <laughs> the thing that whales have. There's oh. nothing... The melon, yeah, and then there's nothing in the lower... The whales have the stuff in the lower jaw, and I don't... There's... The, the quadrates are weird, and that's part... Like, they have a quadrate. The quadrate has a tympanic membrane. They have an ear. They have a lizard ear. So they're probably growling and hissing at each other just like modern squamates do. Sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, okay. So I think that signals the end of it. Uh, but now people are going to go draw uh, Mosasaurs with melons. So that is something that has been inspired. So fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you guys so much for thank coming on. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having us. I hope to see you guys in the chat or elsewhere during the rest of the week. Sure, I'll, I'll hover in the chat for a little bit in case there's any residual questions. I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't say anything before I joined the chat, but yeah, I'm going to go. Right. Apparently, Dr. Carr is angry about stuff, and so I'd like to go participate in that. Um, Why is Dr. Carr angry? <laughs> I don't know. So, so we have two mottos. In it, Carthage Paleo, we have two mottos. Una historia, una veritas, one history, one truth, because, you know, evolution. And I actually, like, I got my class ring in the mail the other day, and so I have that in there. The other one is panic and rage. And that, was by, that was also with Dr. Carr, because we, sure. that is our experience of being, is panic and rage. And so, sure. recently, it's been a lot of rage. Um, yeah, I mean. A lot of things I'm angry about, but, uh, yeah, so I'm going to go good, check good that plan. out. <laughs> okay, I, well, thank black. you guys again. I'm the, black sheep. I'm the black sheep of the group because I don't it's have angry. a kind of rage, you know, like, like I, I'm just happy. Like I saw, um, I saw a prehistoric road trip and I saw people I'm friends with get interviewed and stuff. So I'm, I'm just happy about that. Like, yeah, there's right. other stuff, but you know, but yeah, that, I, that's a really cool show. I'm glad that it's happening and that it's detracting from the show about fossil thievery. Yeah. That shall not be named. That one. <laughs> that one um okay so yes thank you guys again uh cannot state that enough and i guess we will now transition into our general time um but yeah thank you guys so much thank you cool thanks for having us yep bye, bye. <laughs> okay